Uh, thank you so much for coming, first of all. My name is Sarah Eisenhower, and I am the director of the Center for Wild Bird Rehabilitation, which is one of the uh, three main departments that we have at the Vermont Institute of Natural Science. So I am in charge of our avian rehabilitation. So we take in any kind of injured, orphan, or, wa or sick wild bird. And we obviously see to it that we try to get them treated and the ultimate goal is to get them back out into the wild. Um, and we're also in charge of overseeing all of the live animals that are in our collection. So we do have a several species and a variety of different raptors that are on exhibit and also used for our education program. So myself and a few other staff are in charge of all living things non-human at this. <laughs> I'm in charge of humans too, you know, but uh, a lot more wild animals and, not, and captive uh, raptors. So, this program, I was actually approached um, over a year ago by the Mascoma chapter of the Audubon Society to come up with some interesting program about me, <laughs> birds, birding community, and just so happens that I'm also really heavily involved with avian rehab. So I am kind of a mishmash of an overall major bird nerd. So they wanted me to put that into a program style event. Um, so this is the second time I've given this program. Um, so it is pretty much a story about how I came to be at Vince, how I came to get to know the birding community here in the Upper Valley, and how being involved in both organization and the community is actually helping me be better at both things. They really complement each other. So without further ado, I'm going to get started now. Mind you, I will have to kind of just stand here because the clicker thingy doesn't work, so I have to manually do this. So I'm sorry, I'll always be on this side. I will not be able to walk around. Um, so I'm gonna get started with just a little bit of my history. Um, why did I choose birds? Um, why didn't I choose stamp collecting or dendrology or anything else? There are a million and one hobbies out there. Birds struck a chord with me when I was just this little person right here. And, <laughs> And uh, I know, right? <laughs> My mom, she's just happy to share that photo with me. Um, and also because of this person, my grandmother. She wasn't what I would say a crazy avid birder, but she was very into backyard birding. She had a beautiful backyard, a lush garden, a grape arbor. She had everything that was complementary to attracting birds to your backyard. She always had a nest box with a family of house wrens in it. And I would spend a whole month of the summer with my grandmother every summer since I was wee little and even up into my early teens. And she and I would always just watch the bird activity in your backyard. And believe it or not, my grandmother didn't live too far from the Susquehanna River. This is in Pennsylvania, by the way. And she had a green heron that would nest in her big Norway spruce tree. So bizarre because it wasn't really close to water, but it was there every year. It had this just giant weird stick nest. So I remember that so clearly and how that was so attractive to me, all these different things. So my grandmother and I would sit at her little kitchen table and we, does anybody remember these? Oh. Yes, oh my gosh, I still have it. I keep it in a little safe safety little box because my grandmother gave it to me she would always write down everything I would see in it, like say a species of bird the first time I saw it and was able to recognize it. Then she'd write the date, the weather, all these <laughs> things. So I have this keepsake book still. So it's, it really holds really dear to my heart. But my grandmother was really what sparked me onto birds. Then as I got older, I found out about fascinating things like Mr. David Attenborough and the life of birds when I was early teens. I went to Wisconsin to visit my sister. She was interning at the International Crane Foundation. How amazing is that place? And I went there to see her, but I was more interested in the cranes. <laughs> um, so I got to know all of those kind of species of birds in the Midwest, and I found that book in their nature shop store that they had. And I just lost my mind and was just so excited to read that. Then I found out they made a movie series out of it and all these documentaries, so it just continued my obsession, really, and my passion continued to go further along with those things. Then I found out you can get jobs working with birds. So my first job as a college student was at the uh, Penn State-owned nature center called Shavers Creek Environmental Center. I'm sorry, am I blocking your view? 
Um, and this place is just a nature center with non-releasable raptors. They don't do rehab or anything like that. But I started there as an intern and I realized that you know you can work with raptors intimately by public education with them on the glove. And they had eagles. This is a broadwing hawk that I have there on the glove. They had great horned owls, they had barn owls, they had um, red shouldered hawks, they had a variety of raptors there. So that was my first taste of career choices that were existing out there that I didn't know about. And it just so happened that I went to Penn State University. So this was perfect. It was Penn State owned, so I was just like, well, I'm going over there. So, yes, it blinks. I noticed that the first time and I thought it was hallucinating. I was like, this thing's eye moves. It's pretty cute. So then I was working there for two summers in a row, and they had a woman brought us uh, a uh, common grackle fledgling. We don't rehabilitate birds at, at Shavers Creek, and I had no clue about birds as the physiological and the medical care that they need. I just knew them in the field, like how to identify them. I knew nothing about their anatomy. So this person just drops this baby grackle off, and it's in this, you know, like obnoxious looking like parakeet cage with these parakeet toys all in it. The poor little thing's like, ah, in the bottom. Um, but she was doing it out of the kindness of her heart. She didn't know where else to go. And that was when I finally discovered. Yes, yes. See, it does, yes. <laughs> now everybody's just watching now. Um, that's when I discovered. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's how I discovered that there is avian rehabilitation out there and it is a field that exists and I was not aware of that as many people aren't that's now that I am strongly involved in avian rehab I still can't tell you enough how many people don't know we exist that avian rehab is an option for that injured little bird you found so that's whenever I looked up the rehabber that was not too far away from the Shavers Creek location got the grackle to her and I was just like oh my gosh this is what I want to do I mean I love the education aspect but my heart was way further involved in the commitment I made to that little bird, and I knew that was the next chapter I wanted to pursue. So, as I was getting near graduation, I realized this is where I need to be. And I found the Vermont Institute of Natural Science on, oh gosh, it was probably one of those job postings listservs that are for college students, you know, for internships and everything. I can't remember the name. But it just so happened that my bosses at the time at Shavers Creek had just recently visited Vids as well. This is back in 2008. And they came back from the trip. It was like a professional development trip for them. And I'm, they knew I was seeking jobs in the field of avian rehab. And they're like, you, you've got to check out Vids. They have raptor education and they do avian rehab. And I'm like, just avian I love mammals, guys, but just not my thing. I like birds. So I, I was like, just avian rehab. They're like, yes just avian rehab so i got on the vins website and i saw that they were looking for internships and i applied and i got the job so as you can see i moved to queechy vermont right out of graduation so i was not even in pennsylvania for more than two weeks and i moved to vermont knew nobody up here nothing about vermont just a little person from pennsylvania coming up here and i haven't looked back so i come to vermont and I say, oh my gosh, look at what I'm doing. Look at this stuff. This is just incredible. Like, this is exactly what I was looking for. Not just am I able to see these birds in my hands, but I'm able to help them. I'm able to get them back out in the wild. What we have here is a male hooded merganser that I got to release um, into the Connecticut, where, in the, where the Connecticut and White River meet in White River Junction there. Um, I'm syringe, can you believe this? This is a hummingbird. So tiny, and I'm syringe feeding it. So I was doing all these amazing things with these birds in an avian rehab setting, but my birding hobby was still not being met. And I, I was always a birder in Pennsylvania, but I didn't know how strong a hobby that was for everyone. Well, not everyone, but a lot of people out there. I wasn't aware of how to even connect with people like that. My friends picked on me because I did that, and they weren't interested in it. You know, so I wasn't sure, like, how do I, how do I get to know where the good hot spots are for birding? So there was a lot of unanswered questions, and I just kind of felt like I need more than just this. And I started talking to my coworkers, and they told me about, well, we're, you know, subscribed to the Upper Valley Birding List Search. And I thought, oh, well, that's great. And I said, well, what's it used for? And if those of you in here aren't familiar, it's a listserv just for the birding community in the Upper Valley, where you can post 
hot spots where you've seen special birds. You can discuss events like this. How many of you saw my post for this event? Yes, I know, it was a little short notice, but it was on there. So a lot of, and not even just birds, but just natural history, anything nature related is on this listserv. So I found out about that. Then one of my uh, buddies at work said, well, have you heard of eBird? I was like, what's that? It is this fantastic website. How many of you are familiar with eBird? Okay. eBird is a fantastic website. It's a portal. It's, you can use it throughout the entire world, but some states have their own seg, se, uh, set eBird. So Vermont does. And you can go on there and you can plug in any bird you've ever seen in your entire life, wherever you've seen it, what time you saw it, everything, and it will consolidate all this information into your own personal life list, also contributing this data to a huge database for the state you're in, the county you're in, the town you're in, and country. it's a, yeah, what's that? The country. Country, exactly. I it's put an, my from yeah, yeah, it's an amazing way to contribute to citizen science. And that information is used. And I <clears throat> found that out the hard way by knowing how people are watching what you're posting on eBird. And it's not just some little portal to use for your own hobby. When I first moved here, I, it's kind of blurry because I had a really poor camera at the time. Does anybody know what that might be? I don't know if there's a lot of hardcore birders in here. And it's okay if you don't. That is a female common eider. An eider is a species of sea duck. Very, for, for absolutely no reason do they need to come inland. They strictly are coastal species of ducks. They're oceanic species of diving duck. This was on the Ottaquiche River down by Dewey's Mill Pond. I don't know why, but I just happened to be there birding because I was living in Queechee near Vince at the time. And I was like, huh, I didn't think anything of it. I was like, that's an eider, okay. So I took a picture of it just for funsies, and then I went put it into eBird. Right away, I was flagged. eBird will flag you if you enter a rare bird species. And I remember I couldn't even put it in. It wasn't even on the list. I had to say, I had to manually put the bird in. So then I do that, and I was like, call me an eider. I'm, and said, well, we need more I, you know, information on this. I'm like, okay, well, I've seen these on the coast. I'm really familiar. I had no idea what I was doing. And then I get this email from a, a person named Spencer Hardy. Never heard of him before in my life. <laughs> these, these two know. They're like super eBird users. <laughs> um, and he's like, well, we need you to fill out a rare species documentation form. And I was just like, oh, OK. <laughs> like, I had no idea that there were people out there that were like, we are on you with this. And so I said, well, I have a photo. They're like, perfect. So apparently that was the first record of an eider in the state of Vermont. It's never been inland, at least for the past, oh gosh, George would know how many years now, but it, was, it made a big deal. And, and one of my birding buddies, Ed Hack, was teasing me, and he still does, he says to me, yeah, I saw your name, I was like, who the heck is that? Because the birding community all knows each other's names. And so we recognize like new people versus the people that are, you know, definitely reliable, able to identify things. So, so it was just really interesting. I was like, I had no idea that this community was out there. And I was thrilled that my first contribution was this. Not very exciting to some people, but it was pretty exciting for the birders in the Upper Valley. So long story short, that's why I just started birding everywhere. I was looking for, that's Bristol, Vermont, went all the way up there to see the Sandhill Cranes that were at the, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the lake up there. That's at Victory Bog, looking for the white ring crossbills when they were still there. And this is just a Union Village Dam, one of my favorite places in Thetford to go birding. I have great migratory species that pass through there. So I was just going all over the place. So then I was like, you know, as a birder and as an avian wildlife rehabilitator, I started noticing that things were kind of blending together and in a good way because as an avian wildlife rehabilitator you really need to know your birds to do that job and I don't mean you just need to know what a bird is you need to know the species in your area that you are rehabilitating and every little natural history fact about them because it's not a matter in it that I get a bird in you know, I give it a little bowl of water, I splint its wing, and it's good to go, and a dish of seed. That is just not how simple it is. And I realized that having the skill sets of an avid birder that just came to me naturally was incredibly beneficial for me to 
completely speed up the learning curve that most people do have entering into the AV and rehab field, that I was just like, pow, pow, pow. Because I knew the patients before I even took that job. So for example, as I was saying, the identification of birds. Wow. Just, just take a stab. Starling. Nope. Nope. Pterodactyl? <laughs> this is a nestling bolted kingfisher. I never would have guessed that. I would have done exactly what you guys guessed had I not known the, the little nuances of belted kingfishers. First of all, this little thing came in and it was going like a kingfisher does. Kingfishers rattle and chatter when they're calling to each other. He had this huge, huge beak. And what was even cooler, and I wish I, sh I had that photo up there, their feet are so disproportionate to their body. These teeny, tiny, and they only have two toes in the front and two in the back. So they're not your normal three toes in the front, one in the back, perching feet. Super, super duper tiny. And it occurred to me, oh my gosh, this makes perfect sense. They live in burrows. They have those tiny feet so they get into the burrows. And those giant beaks, they not only use that to capture and swallow fish, but they use their beaks as trowels to hollow out burrows on the side of banks, like on river banks and stuff. So it all made sense to me this is why this bird looks like this. And this is how I know it's what it is, because listen to the sounds it's making and look at the shape of its body. So those things I was connecting together because of what I knew about their habits in the wild. Does that make sense? Because it just, it just clicked in me. So understanding that difference of knowing birds in the field helps you know how to provide the best care possible for them in a captive setting, especially with birds you know you gotta keep for a long time. Because a lot of these birds, not a lot, all of them have no idea you're helping them. They see you and they're like, oh my gosh, you're gonna eat me, you're gonna eat me, you're gonna eat me. They live in just a constant state of fear in rehab, which is why we have to be super careful with how we're handling them, how we're treating them, making sure they're not overexposed to our presence because you also don't wanna do what's called habituation which then they lose the fear, and then they're thinking humans are friends, because not all humans are friends. So we had to figure this balance out, and my ability to understand what they need to be happy in the wild was really beneficial to be able to provide that to the best of our ability in a captive setting. So for example, dietary needs. You know how I made that remark, like you can't just give them a dish of water and a little plate of seed. Well. Not to these little guys, you can't. This is an American woodcock. An American woodcock is one of our few strictly terrestrial inland sandpipers. They're the ones that come in the spring, and you may have probably heard them, they go, me, me. They sound like that, and they do crazy aerial displays and everything. So how many of you have seen or heard woodcocks? Yep. So they are gonna be showing up here pretty soon <coughs> in April. They're gonna be painting, is what that's called, and doing their aerial displays. Well, they're itty bitty little babies that are probably about just like that. Very high stress. I mean, you just look at them the wrong way or they'll die. They're super <laughs> high stress. They eat earthworms and other small invertebrates. So I have to make sure I give them plenty of dirt, plenty of live earthworms. But when they're that teeny tiny, they don't just find them on their own and eat. Mom and mom, especially, she's probing and pulling out worms for her and feeding them to them. So I have to do that, and it is insanely difficult to replicate that. So it's just one example of knowing, well, what do woodcocks do in the wild? I gotta replicate that. We would give these little guys big plates of dirt and leaf litter, and they just loved it. they go in and just dig around it, because that's what they're doing in the wild. So putting him in like a, a little box with just a towel and stuff like that, that is not normal for a little guy like that. And they're usually in tiny little groups. So babies, there's multiple babies, so you have to make sure you provide them. If you got a little single guy like this, give him a mirror. He needs to see himself because he will think that there's other babies in there with him. They don't do good as little singles. So understanding that, <laughs> this is a pretty easy example. Bard house, eat mice. However, you'll be surprised that a lot of people may not understand that. I actually just recently got a call from a concerned citizen who had a, a starving, we have a lot of starving barred owls right now in the Upper Valley, a lot of calls coming in about that. 
she had a bar down in her backyard, it was struggling, you know, I mean, it was still able to fly, so it was really difficult for us to pro provide rescue at that time. But bless her heart, she's like, well, I was throwing seed out in front of it and dried fruit. And I'm just like, oh, it's super sweet of you, but I, you know, it actually wouldn't eat that. They're carnivores, they only eat rodents. She's like, so that's why he's here. Because she was feeding the birds, so he was attracted to her rodent community and everything. So she didn't know, but that's okay. That's what we're here for. And then caging these, aren't they adorable? These little fledgling northern flickers, it's a species of woodpecker, very common in this area in the summertime. They're clinging birds. You cannot just put them in something they can't cling to. They, but flickers are the only exception. They do spend time on the ground, sometimes in the wild, because they eat ants. Otherwise, like all other woodpeckers, they want to be vertical. Vertical, vertical, vertical. It is not natural for them to be in a box on the ground. That is unsafe for them. It makes them very fearful and uncomfortable. So this is actually just plain old rubber shelf liner that you put in your kitchen cupboards. Perfect. And they cling to it and they are adorable and it makes them feel safe and comfortable. So understanding those kind of basic things. Fledgling American bittern. American bitterns are rarely seen because they are incredible hiders. They're in the thick, thick marshes where the cattails and the reeds and all that stuff. And if you even try to find one and he sees you coming, then he goes, hmm? And those stripes on his neck and his head and his bills pointing straight upwards. However, his eyes can then roll forward. So even though his head is vertical, he's still watching you. But he's all vertical lined and he blends right in with those reeds. So we went and grabbed a bunch of Phragmites. So not only were we doing good for him, but we were re removing invasives at the same time. <laughs> And we give him the best of our ability, water, this blue blanket, you know. But what we were trying to do is just give him comfort. He wanted to hide, and he wanted to get in those reeds. So putting him again in just this big open space, no hiding places, it's just that stress alone can impede their ability to progress through rehab. So now you get in the baby birds, which is coming up on us. Baby bird season comes quicker than we're ready for, ever. It's always just like, it's like a bomb goes off and all these birds just come into our facility at once. So that's usually <clears throat> anytime as soon as late April. Morning doves, they're already courting. Morning doves are usually the first babies that we get and ravens. Ravens are already building nests. So we're, we're gearing up and then the owls are getting ready. I mean, everything's happening, so we're gearing up. But the key to meshing the skill sets that I have, understanding them in the field, applying that to rehab, really, really hit home when baby, my first baby bird season came. Because baby birds don't look anything like the adults. Very rarely can you look at a baby bird and say, well, you're a spitting image of your mom and dad. You know, it's nothing like that. So being able to know those little subtle markings or the sounds that they make really helped me. So now this is your turn. I'm going to test you guys. You ready? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes. What species of grosbeak? Rosebush. Indeed. That is a fledgling, just, just recently fledged, little Albert Einstein tufts going on there. Rose-breasted grosbeak. Now, I knew I could whittle it down to a gross beak because that giant, what they call conical size or shaped beak, very large seed, you know, cherry stone hauling beak, like cardinals, they have those big, big beaks. But he made sounds that literally sounded exactly like the call notes of the adult gross beaks. And I heard, I, I, there's nothing else that sounds like that, very, very almost metallic, just sharp sound that they make. And he was making those sounds. I was like, oh my gosh. And then I saw, it's hard to see on here, but do you see just this ever so slightly flush of yellow? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When they're juveniles, now male rose-bested ghost beaks are called that, I mean, because they have that nice, beautiful, rosy pink bib going on here, and they also have it under their wing pits. He was developing a bib of yellow and under his wing pits. And the juveniles, when they have all their feathers in and are actually flighted, their first year birds is what we call them, have that. So I was like, oh my gosh, that's a rose breasted gross beak. So I was able to deduce what that species was from its look, its appearance, and its sound. Just what, you can just say it, we call them LBJs, little brown jobbies. That's just all they are. They're just this unidentifiable little brown bird. No? It's a species of sparrow, but sparrow is not in its name. 
Hint, hint. Dark eyed junco. Dark eyed junco is a species of sparrow, and the reason I was able to fit, because right away I was like, oh, it must be a song sparrow. Song sparrows are incredibly common around here. However, the nest was found at a higher elevation, and it had already obtained the white flash of outer tail feathers. They already have that as fledgling birds. Adults have that, but these guys have it when they're when their little nestlings going on fledgling. So that's how. Oh, and they sound like crazy, like little robots. They're like like this weird buzzy metallic sound that they make, which adults don't make. I just wanted you guys to know that. <laughs> All right. Oh my gosh. Choice. <laughs> just a mouth. <laughs> I would be shocked if anybody knew what that was, honestly, because I had no idea at first. That is the mouth of a nestling cedar waxwing. Wow. Those neon racing stripes. Now, it was, it was struck, uh, struck like, to be odd to me because waxwings build typical nests in trees. They're not cavity nesters. And what I, what I mean by saying that is a lot of times cavity nesting species of birds have very striking, almost iridescent mouth parts. Whether it's a very large, almost clown-like, fleshy, bright colored uh, uh, corners of their mouths, or they'll have bright, flashy markings within the, the, the soft tissue inside their mouth. And the reason for that is because when the mom or dad goes in to feed the young in that dark hole of the cavity, they need like a, a target point to put the food in the baby's mouth. There's no lamp to switch on in there. And when the mom or dad is in the hole, they're blocking that only source of light. So whatever dim light shines through into that cavity, those little markers are like strike points for the parents so they can deposit their food. I don't know why waxwings have that pink stripe. I want to find out because they don't live in cavities. It's just there. It's just beautiful. So. I didn't know that about waxwings, but what I did know is they already start getting their crest feathers in when they're little, and they already start having that black eye stripe. So I was like, oh my gosh, that's a waxwing. And as a birder, I've watched parent waxwings feed babies, and they are bobbleheads. The baby waxwings make this soft trilling sound that you can't really hear, but they just, their heads are just going everywhere. And that's so distinct to baby waxwings when they're begging. So I made that connection. Let's see, and then, Oh my goodness. Are they bats? <laughs> Any idea? Yes, they're definitely naked. <laughs> These are chimney swifts. Chimney swifts are definitely bat-like appearance because they really do live in dark places when they're being reared. And before chimneys came around, it was caves. So. A lot of times we end up finding chimney swifts or they're brought to us, it's because they crawled out of the nest too soon and someone found them at the bottom of their fireplace. They truly do reside on chimneys from us at this point. And at this time in history, there's very few caves around here, so there's literally a need for chimneys, for chimney, sweat, chimney swifts. So that's how we typically get them presented to us because once they fall out of their nest, there's no way to get in that chimney to put them back because they're usually way up high. So <clears throat> chimney swifts definitely look like bats. Look at how bulgy their eyes are. They got giant eyeballs because they need to see well in the dark. And they are the loudest begging birds. So that's how they get mom and dad to feed them properly. It has nothing to do with markings in their mouth. They're just it's just so deafeningly loud. It's almost like obnoxious when you're trying to feed them. You cannot think. It's so loud. But that's how mom and dad's like, oh, you're right there. So that is how that works. So I was starting to realize, oh my gosh, not only am I able to apply my field skills of just being a birder to my rehab skills, I started finding that I was able to reverse that. Learning about these baby birds. I have never seen so many varieties of baby birds in my life until I was in rehab like this, until the baby in rehab. And I started realizing, oh my gosh, I've seen that before, or I've heard that before, and have never known in a million years what that was that I was hearing out in the field when I was birding. For example, these are little adorable fledgling barred owls. Barred owls, when they beg in the wild, and I mean barred owls are just everywhere here. We have no shortage of barred owls in the upper valley. But I never knew what they sounded like when they were communicating with their parents. And they make this really 
loud, it's very hard for me to do, but it's like a shh, shh, but it's like more higher pitch than that. That's their begging sound to mom and dad, and it, it, it carries way louder than I'm able to do. And usually, if you hear that sound and you see a doll barred out anywhere in the vicinity, follow it. It's going to be feeding its young. Mind you, she might still attack you, you know, because they do tend to fly down at your head, and if you're too near their young or their nest. But I did that once. I saw an adult barred owl, heard that sound off in a relative distance, and I found, it was a little older than this, but it was still fuzzy. It was a fledged barred owl. And that was the sound I was hearing. So when I finally heard this in a captive setting, I made the connection. I had no idea what I was hearing before. So other critters that I've made that connection. How cute, oh my gosh, chickadees. They're adorable. They are cavity nesters, right? So you never find them. They're all, and they're tiny, they're tiny little birds as is, as adults. So to ever be able to true, unless you have like an active chickadee nest in a box, like a bird box or a nesting box near your home, good luck finding where they put their nests. Cause they're just, they're, they're the weirdest places. Sometimes, sometimes it's like down here. You would think, oh, it must be in a cavity way up here. Sometimes they'll nest close to the ground. So I realized, well, I know how to find them now because I know what they sound like. And they go, oh gosh, it's so cute. <laughs> over and over and over again. So they make these, and it almost sounds like they're saying, feed me, yes. And times six, you can imagine how easy that would be to hear, but not know where it was, because they're in a cavity, so you're not even gonna be able to see them. And I started hearing chickadees all the time as a birder now. So it was all meshing together. Oh my gosh, Eastern bluebirds, we don't get them very often. Um, but I, I've seen adult bluebirds plenty of times in the wild, and they look nothing like the adults. I mean, they're completely speckled. They have just a hint of blue coming in on their tail feathers and their primaries here, but that's it. And they sound like laser guns. They're like, pew, pew. That's what they sound like when they're begging. So for me, it was like, that sounds so close to the ee of the actual doll, but it's very like nasally. So. I was able to say, oh my gosh, that bird over there that had no idea what that was, because it looks nothing like a bluebird. That's a bluebird. It's just a teenage bluebird, and it's still begging, even though parents are like, we're not feeding you. So it, it just, I, I know I'm like super excited about this, but that, I can't help it. Like this is, these are the fascinations that I've discovered along the years, and I'm still discovering it. Fledgling red-eyed vireo. This was the biggest aha moment that I have ever had. Vireos, red-eyed vireos, are very common very common species of vireo. They have a very beautiful, uh, constant song, especially in the dead of summer when everybody's quiet and it's too hot, even the birds aren't singing. Your classic red-eyed vireo will never stop singing. He will sing for you all summer long. And at the very tippy tops of trees, you can barely see him. And I never knew that the sound that I would always hear in the vicinity of a singing vireo, I never knew what it was. It drove me crazy for years. It was this me, 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 and just over and over and over again. And I was like, what, what is that? And the trees are fully leaved out, so it's like you can't see who's up there. And then there would always be a vireo nearby singing, but I never made the connection that that was the begging sound of a fledged teenage vireo. Then, as they came into rehab, which we get a, a good handful of them every couple of times, we deemed them the vibrating vireos because fledged vireos do not stop their whole body just vibrates all the time when they're begging it's ridiculous so when I started going birding then after knowing this and I would hear those sounds I hear the vireo and I hear that little sound I would look for this little guy and sure enough he's clung to a branch the parents around you know trying to like get him to go away because you know they're weaning them away and he's just clung to that branch and he's just vibrating violently, begging to his parents. And I was just like, oh my gosh, for years I had no idea that's what that was. It was the same species of bird. So, and then lastly, my favorite, the fledgling young crows. Just ridiculous. Although you gotta be really careful, crows are on that borderline of what's called the potential to imprint. Do you guys know what imprinting is? Yeah, go ahead. Do you want to explain what imprinting is? Imprinting is when young birds get really attracted to humans, mm -hmm. and they start thinking that they're 
That is perfect. She said, when a young bird is attracted to humans, and they start to think that they are a human. That is exactly what imprinting is. Very good. Very good thing to know, too. Because, boy, don't we just love all these cutesy little baby birds. Boy, wouldn't these cutesy little baby birds make great pets? <laughs> no! No, 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 no. Especially the birds that can imprint, and crows are a serious imprint possibility. So we have to be very careful with that. And by the way, it's not, it's, you can't reverse imprinting either. Once it happens, the bird will never reverse back to being wild again. So crows, being as intelligent as they are, unfortunately we can't spend a lot of time with them in rehab, so we gotta hurry up going. We wear a ridis ridiculous mask with black feathers on it. When we go to feed them, we have to wear gloves. No one else can be in the vicinity of eyesight. No one can be talking around, and then we caw at them. So we really have to try our best to mimic, as best as we can, a crow-like mannerism. But what's super cute about crows is something else I didn't realize. When you feed them, you know, it's not like feeding a baby bird where you just gently with a pair of tweezers give them little bites and they just ever so gratefully take the food and eat it. Crows are m messy, demanding, nasty little things. And <laughs> They need you to take just your fingers and shove it down their throat. <laughs> and when you do that, they're begging like crazy. They're like, ah, you know, like calling and I'm begging. But then they don't stop begging, vocalizing the begging while you're shoving it down their throat. So literally, it goes down their throat. They're like, ah, and then they go, ah, blah, 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 like that. It is, so, it is so ridiculous. And every time, without fail. So my friends and I at Vins started hearing that in the wild. And we always knew when there was a family of crows around, because crows are very pair, pair bonded and family groups are very tight, so they don't just fledge and go away. They stay together all season long. And the, the teenage crows usually don't ever really stop begging. The parents just choose to stop feeding them that way. But when you hear it, all of a sudden you hear these crows just cawing and you hear them and everything, and then out of nowhere you hear this, you're like, oh, she, she gave in, she gave him food. You know, so it's just so funny, the sounds that you just never knew how to make that connection. And seeing them in that setting, right in your hands, doing the caretaking of them, and then finally taking that into the field and being like, oh my gosh, all of these aha moments just kept hitting me left, right, and sideways. It was just incredible. And being able to reverse that knowledge back to knowing how to provide the most natural care to the avian patients was critical. It really helps in your success as a rehabber. So I'm always learning. I mean, how many of us have seen great blue herons, but from the safety of our binoculars? How many of you have been in a small room with a heron? <laughs> how about it? Yeah. Yes! They are not dumb, neither are bitterns. They know where your eyes are, and they go straight for them every time. A heron? When he decides to elongate and stand straight, he is this tall compared to me. He could hit me in the eye, not, not, even, not even a hesitation. When we deal with birds like this, we have to wear long gloves because they also have incredibly razor sharp edges to their bills because they catch fish and fish are slippery. So they have to have this amazingly sharp, finely serrated edge to their bills that just cut you like a knife, really. So not only can they bite you, strike at your flesh, and cut you, they will go for your eyes. And they have a very long reach with that nice, beautifully coiled neck right there. It's like a snake. So we have to wear goggles. I mean, it, it's insane. I was just like, you know, I, I would rather observe you in a river than in this setting. And they also croak like dinosaurs at you. It is frightening if you've never heard one, then all of a sudden it's in a room with you, and it's like this crazy, oh my gosh. Judy's prompting me to make the sound. <laughs> oh, um, oh, they're like, oh, I can't do it. Oh, I can't. It's just this absolute horrible sound. It just made a complete fool of myself trying. Um, <laughs> yeah. Raptors. Uh, we all know raptors have talons and that they're sharp. And we all know they have sharp beaks. But again, in close quarters, it's a whole other ball game because their defense is those sharp talons. And when you go in to try to capture them, they're gonna meet you with that defense. And I don't mean like they're just gonna do this to you. They throw themselves on their back and they're just like that. And that's all you have to work with. Somehow you gotta find a way to get in there with gloves on and try to restrain those legs and get the bird out. 
And not to mention, there are some species of raptors that are psychotic in rehab. <laughs> Excipiters. So goshawks are a type of excipitor. And then there's also sharp-shinned hawks and cooper's hawks. They are psycho in rehab. I mean, they're a bird that we just try so hard to not keep for long if we can help it because they can literally kill themselves with their own just high-strung nature. And many, many years ago, that happened to us. We had to flight taste test one. He was so spazzed out in that cage, he broke his own neck. He just hit the wall. It was awful. So we got to keep that in mind. I mean, if there's any of these birds that are on here that I prefer in rehab, it's a good old red-tailed hawk. They're nice and chill most of the time. <laughs> Merlins are a type of falcon. They're the smaller species of falcon that we have here. The other one is the American kestrel. And then the largest one is the peregrine falcon. Again, high, strong, high, strong. High. Oh my gosh, they just make me get premature gray hair. I just can't, can't deal, but we have to. And I know that because I know what they're like in the wild. They never stop moving. How many of you have bird feeders up? winter time. How many of you have seen a flash of gray go through your backyard and all of a sudden all the birds are either frozen silent or they just are gone or the blue jays are going nuts? Probably Mr. Cooper's or Mr. Sharpshin just paid a visit to your backyard and that's about the closest glimpse you're going to get of that bird. Right through. And sometimes when they go right through they also took a bird with them. So they are always high strung, very fast animals. Ruffed grouse. Adorable, right? I hate having them in rehab because they are explosive. What they do is they are the, the you know that the, the term fight or flight? They're the flight. They don't fight, they flight. And they have that like deer in headlights look on them all the time. And the reason why they are the way they are is they are unfortunately a heavily preyed upon animal. They're, they're a meal ticket. And like morning doves the same way. They are the birds that their only way of escaping a predator is to immediately just explode into action and fly away. How many times have you seen morning doves sitting perfectly still and all of a sudden they just go <laughs> You know, and pigeons do it too. They're heavily preyed upon by fast, catch you unaware raptors. So the exhibitors like I was just mentioning. So in a rehab setting, it is ridiculous because he's just like bandage on his head, isn't it so cute? <laughs> um, a little, little punk on his head. Um, in a rehab setting, we try to keep them in a confined space if we can. The bigger space you put an animal in, the more room it has to hurt itself. You gotta keep that in mind. We try to keep them in a dark, confined space, nice and quiet, don't disturb. It's like the rough grouse, it's like, don't look at the grouse. And the minute you try to go in, it's sitting nice and quiet in the back, and you're like, oh, I can approach this bird. And the minute you go to get it, Boo! It just explodes. Its wings are flapping, feathers are flying. It is so ridiculous. So you have to be super careful. Then these little guys here, they get a condition from just being exposed to fear too much called capture myopathy, where that fight or flight response kicks in so strong in their body that excessive lactic acid builds up in their muscle tissue and it literally breaks the muscles down and atrophies them. And they die from it. They literally die of fear, metabolically. So they're really stressful. I'm trying to speed up here, guys. Sorry. Um, and then the last couple ones we got here are the, like I was saying, there's the northern goshawk. They're super high stress. That's a northern harrier. Never, ever had one ever again in rehab. That was my first and, and one and only baby northern harrier. Incredibly unique. They're a species of raptor in their own category. I mean, a lot of people may know them as the marsh hawk. A lot of people call them marsh hawks. Um, they nest in big open fields in the tall grasses and near marshlands, so you never really see them. And the only reason these little guys came to us is the person accidentally mowed down the field they were nesting in. The parent, nobody got hurt, but the nest was destroyed, and, and actually, no, actually one of the babies did get mowed over. Um, so just seeing them in the rehab setting and understanding that stuff about them has really helped me figure out how to not accidentally kill them myself. Um, and then, of course, the waterfowl, we get tons of waterfowl. We got all of these wood ducklings and then your token common merganser. Um, and then these are goslings, Canada goslings, and they're also imprintable, so you have to be really careful with them too. So if you have tons of them together, that is way better than having one by itself because it will imprint on you, especially goslings. Jeez, I keep going here. All right, double-crested cormorant and northern gannet were some really rare species that we got in. The northern gannet was from um, uh, uh, Tropical Storm Irene. 
he should not be inland at all. He should be out in the open ocean. He's strictly what we call a pelagic species, which means they are on the open ocean only. He got blown in by the storm, and unfortunately, he did not survive. He was with us for only about <clears throat> less than 48 hours. And neither did the cormorant. The cormorant just died of starvation. It was a, it's a bird you will find in land in the rivers, but they're way more at home in big open waters, open lakes, and of course, the shores and the oceans. Now, I have videos of my running bad on time. Anybody no, here? Is Manny on time? <laughs> sure, no, okay. So I have like release videos for you guys to make this a little more exciting. So this is the tail end of my stories here, and this is just why I do what I do. This is the most satisfying parts of my job. So first thing we have here is a common re loon release. What I'll do though, folks, is I will zip through like all my yammering, because before I knew the etiquette of doing release videos, I talked way too much. <laughs> so you, you're already watching me talk, you don't need to see me doing it on here too. Um, so it might take a minute to boot up here. Uh, but this was the very first loon I ever saw up close like this, and the first thing that blew my mind was they're huge, huge in your arms and strong. Hello. Um, I'm such a nerd. Here today we have <laughs> Lincoln Common Loon that came here. to us from Brandon, Vermont. Actually, so at least you know that's where he came from. So while this is loading and while I'm trying to find where we actually do the release, I'll tell you where this loon, what happened to this bird, and it happens a lot with um, water birds, especially migratory water birds like loons, grebes, things like that. They sometimes will migrate at night. And what will happen is as they're flying, they'll mistake wet parking lots as bodies of water because the glare of that light on the surface and the black color makes them think it's like a pond or a lake. And every year without fail, we get what we call a grounded bird. And loons and grebes in particular are completely helpless on land. And the reason being is they are such just designated diving birds that their legs are anatomically positioned on the backs of their bodies. It's not under them like a duck. It's on the back, like like uh, like um, paddles almost, like like the paddles of a boat. So when they end up on land, they can't stand up. They need water to take off and to land. That's the only way they can mobilize themselves. So when they land on, on a hard surface, they're literally stranded. And believe it or not, every stranded diving bird, whether it's grebe or loon that I've ever gotten, has never sustained a serious injury. I don't know how. They're crash landing on asphalt. And they typically only have just a little scrape here, a little scrape there. We've never had one that we couldn't immediately send back out. And thank goodness, because they do not do well in a rehab setting, and we don't have the capacity to rehab birds like that. You need bodies of water, big pools, huge pond shaped like, like those above ground swimming pools, that's what you need for a loon. You can't put that little guy in a kiddie pool. Mm -mm. So, here we go. Uh, where was I? All right, and it's so cute, because he yodels the whole time. He vocalizes, and that was awesome for me. All right. And you just watch as I'm getting him out, and the whole time I'm like, please don't spare me in the face. <laughs> like, it was so stressful. Oh gosh, no, we don't want that cartoon video. <laughs> Bear with me, folks. 
Want to learn to code by no. making computer games, even Susan if you've got no experience? <laughs> My name is Ben, I'm an entrepreneur and online educator. And I'm Reed, so I'm a professional Sorry, software engineer. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Wrong. These are common raven babies. Um, the uh, let's see, look at Where that. Did you let it go? Um, this was out. Um, well, Mary, do you remember? Yes, in Palm Prairie. Yes, it was up in the, up in the mountain. They were like uh, their house was like up on a mountain, so it was like this beautiful location, wow. very open, wide woods, perfect for ravens. Um, the ravens, they're an early nesting species, so they're typically, their babies are typically hatched and they're being fed and everything as soon as late April or mid to late April. So what ends up happening a lot of times with ravens, they nest very, very high, 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 high up in pine trees, and their nests sometimes get accidentally cut down by loggers. And that's how these guys came to us. And the loggers were so sweet. They were so concerned. They brought the whole nest with us. <laughs> and these birds, now this doesn't do it justice. You could probably, I could probably fit my fist in that mouth. That's how big. So it's like a crow baby, but times one million in noise and mess. So we had three of them. So fortunately, we're able to raise them together. So we have avoided the, the uh, potential of imprinting. Um, and this was a really fantastic release. Um, all three of them went off, and they all went separate directions, which was really funny. I was like, oh, I hope you guys are okay with not being together anymore, because you all left each other. Um, let's see here. Oh, Go ahead, you ready? All right. Hello, my name is Sarah, and I work at the Vermont Institute of Natural Science. We are a not-for-profit organization whose that mission is to motivate okay, individuals to care for the environment talk about through education, Before research, and avian wildlife rehabilitation. And today, we are going to be releasing three common ravens. These ravens came into our care at the rehab facility at Vins okay, on April 21st, small, sorry, so and what happened to these birds is that they were nestlings at that time um, and they were nesting up in a tree, way high up in a pine tree, and this tree got accidentally cut down by some loggers. Uh, the loggers did attempt to re-nest these nestling ravens, but without any success. So the ravens were then brought to us. We cared for them for over two months, fed them a diet of soaked dog food, chopped mice, fruit, and egg. Um, and after further watching them grow up in the cages, and we also put them out in a large flight cage so that we could see that they were able to fly really well and feed and care for themselves, they are now deemed releasable. So we are going to let them go back out into the wild. So here we go. Start here. Very big birds. Uh, you ready? Mm. Well, okay. So he goes that way. <laughs> and then siblings. Ooh. Oh, this breeds. You want to help, Sarah? Okay. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Go. Show the camera. And the last one. They are not going to stick around. Get your eggs. Get your eggs. 